Hi there, this is Ranjit from tech2bus.com and welcome to the 12th Q&A uh, session where I'll be answering some of your questions. I'm sorry that I couldn't do the Q&A uh, last week because I was too busy. So let's get on with this Q&A session. And the first question is from Bhanu Pratap and he asks us, Hey Ranjit, I want to buy an Android phone uh, for about Rs. 9000. Please tell me which one should I buy? Uh, he uh, gives us an option of HTC Explorer or the uh, Motorola Fire XT if performance is to be considered and please suggest if there is any better option available and uh, the thing is Banu Pratap uh, I have reviewed the HTC Explorer you can check out my review for more details regarding that uh, but Motorola Fire XT was a good phone but it had a lot of uh, battery issues so I'll be a little bit wary about that but again I can't comment much about the Motorola XT because I haven't done an in-depth review for the same so yeah the what do you say the HTC Explorer looks very good I am just going to review a local mobile phone that's known as the Carbon A9 that's a dual sim phone and I was just testing it and it had a very good build quality so that is also around Rs 9000 and the features that it offers are much uh, better than the HTC Explorer so if you can just wait for a while I'll be posting my review very soon about that Carbon A9 so you can also have a look at that. The next question comes from Lok Chandra and he asks us, Hi Ranjit, your videos are great. It helps me a lot. Thank you. I'm planning to buy a new Android mobile and I'm not new to Android as I have already used the Galaxy Fit but now confused in selecting the best one in my budget. Suggest me a good uh, budget phone for Rs 15,000. Thanks in advance. There's one more similar question to the same so I'll be including both these and it goes something like this. I want to ask you which mobile phone should I buy? My budget is around Rs 15,000. Sony Ericsson or Samsung Galaxy. That's from V1806. Uh, and the thing is that currently in the budget of around 15,000, I personally feel in India, uh, they are not great Android phones that are available. You can go for the, uh, look at the Sony Live with Walkman. That's a decent one. And also there is one known as the Samsung Galaxy Ace Plus. That's also okay, but these are not great phones. Uh, there are some other phones also that are coming out. One is the Sony Xperia U. I might do a review regarding that pretty soon. That's around 16,000 or so. Also have a look at this uh, HTC One V that is now selling in the, what do you say, in the local markets for about 16,500 and that's a very good phone. So I hope this info helps. And the next question comes from George Jacob and he asks us, Hey Ranjit, thanks in advance for your great videos. Thank you. I would like to buy the best Android mobile and a tablet. Uh, but I'm confused on which one to buy. My budget is a total of rupees 60,000 for both the tablet and the phone. I have selected the Samsung Galaxy Tab 750. That's a 10.1 inch tablet. And I'm waiting for the Samsung Galaxy S3. Is there any other tablet or phone better than this? And is it worth it waiting for the Samsung Galaxy S3? Please advise. Also tell me if you had a, a budget of rupees 60,000, which tablet and phone would you buy? Uh, the thing is that regarding the Samsung Galaxy S3, it hasn't been launched yet. I think so it's going to launch around May 29th or May 30th. So just wait for a week or so, you'll have a lot of reviews regarding that. I also might be doing a review for the Samsung Galaxy S3. I generally do not want to give opinions about products that haven't been launched yet because there is a lot of hype around these products and the reality sometimes can be a little bit different. So I would suggest that before going for the Samsung Galaxy S3, just wait for a while. And regarding the tablet, I would not suggest currently the Samsung Tab 750. But instead of that, if you just have a look at this Asus tablet that's known as the Asus Transformer Prime, that's an excellent tablet in my opinion. So again, uh, I hope this answers your question. The next question comes from Bridge Mohan Goel and he asks us, what are the advantages and disadvantages of having a static IB for residential broadband connection? Generally, for most of the residential broadband connection, these ISPs will offer you a dynamic IP. Very few ISPs offer you a static IP and, and I think so you need to pay some extra amount to get a static IP. But static IP can be beneficial in certain situations. Let's say you are hosting a server, then a sta static IP helps. Also, if you are using a VPN, then also a static IP might help you. And I can see one more thing. If you have a lot of, let's say, uh, remote devices like network camera, etc. And you want to just log in from outside the internet, then also the static IP will help. Again, it is not, uh, uh, what do you say, necessary to have static IP for all these services because you can use a third party services like dynamic DNS. Those will work with what do you say the dynamic IP and then also you can access your devices so strictly speaking you don't need a what do you say static IP unless you are doing some kind of web hosting or something like that and again what are the 
uh, advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is that you, you can just have one static IP address and you can just remember and just type it and log into your network. Uh, the disadvantage I would say is that if you download a lot of stuff from websites or something, some sites restrict the amount of data that you can download in a day from a particular IP. So that might be a disadvantage for you. And the next question is from Maynard LKS and he asks us, I'm considering the upcoming Piledriver and Bulldozer or even the Intel Haswell. These are the upcoming processors from AMD and Intel. Haswell is from Intel. Uh, next year, is it smart choice to buy an i5 IV bridge for a mid-range computer or, or during this time? I'm not a pro Intel or a pro AMD user. I'm just going for the best value of money in reference to its performance. What's your personal opinion? The thing is that uh, Pile Driver will uh, by AMD will be launching sometime in later in the 2012. But the Intel Haswell is not going to launch this year. That will come uh, only in 2013. Again, uh, as uh, I said earlier in one of the comments, I am not too fond of speculating the performance of products that haven't been launched yet. For example, let's take the performance of AMD Bulldozer. Theoretically on paper, it was supposed to be very good. But in the real world, the performance I would say was just average. So again, as uh, you have asked me, uh, should I buy the computer right now? I, the simple answer is that if you are doing uh, using this computer for your business or something and you're going to lose money if you're not going to upgrade your system for about eight or nine months just go ahead and buy a computer right now personally uh, i would just buy a computer right away if it was going to affect my business because these both intel has well is approximately a year away from now so yes if you need a computer right away just go with the i5 iv bridge processor i hope that answers your question and the next question is from Prashant and he says he has two questions. The first one is, as the new Ivy Bridge processors are out yet, will Sandy Bridge processors pricing go down? And what's the cost of the new Ivy Bridge processor in India? I'll first answer this question and next we'll go to the second question. Yes, the Ivy Bridge processors have been launched, but sadly still in India, I'm not seeing a lot of Ivy Bridge parts with the end retailers. I think so they are still trying to push the Sandy Bridge inventory that they have. Again, the pricing will be very similar to the sandy bridge parts because intel is not pricing them significantly higher but again uh, you can expect retailers to price it a little bit higher because it's a new part uh, and uh, the second part of the question is does the z77 motherboard support sandy bridge processor the z77 motherboard is the new uh, series for the ivy bridge processor but yes it will support the sandy bridge processor and the next question comes from Velcura Day when he asks, hey Ranjit, keep up the good work. Thank you. What's the difference between torrents and magnetic links? Again, I'm not the best person, person to answer this question because I do very little torrenting. And I'll just try to explain this. Uh, with a torrent file, this file has to be physically hosted on a server. And generally torrent files are a little bit big. It will be a couple of big, uh, what is it, kilobytes to even 100 kilobytes or so. But if you notice a magnetic link, it's a very small file. It's a very small, actually a text file. And these do not need to be physically stored on the server and they occupy a lot of less space. Again, one more advantage that these magnetic links have is that uh, they do not require a dedicated tracker. So if let's say your tracker go, goes down, then also your download will continue. The only con I see with the magnetic link is that uh, with generally with these magnetic links, uh, it will take some time for the download to start. For example, with the torrent uh, link, uh, the download might start just within about 10 or 15 seconds. But with a magnetic link, it can take a couple of minutes. But again, the advantage of magnetic link is that uh, if the, what do you say, the tracker goes down, then also your download will come continue. So that's one advantage and I would say 95% of the torrent clients currently support these magnetic links. So for an end user, it doesn't make a difference if you're using a torrent or a magnetic link. And the next question comes from Priyanka and again this is a two part question. Uh, which is uh, the best for high end gaming, a LCD or a plasma or a LED? Again, uh, this is a very dicey question. Technically speaking, a plasma is the best choice because it does not have any lag. LED in LCD televisions all have a slight lag, but again, the lag is so minuscule. Um, I do not review a lot of LCD televisions, so I'm not well versed what is the current lag time, but generally it used to be around 8 milliseconds or so. Uh, LCD monitors I've seen to go down to around 4 milliseconds. Uh, so if 
technically speaking, plasma is better for gaming because it has virtually no lag. Again, the disadvantage with plasma is that if you have a lot of static images, then you get a temporary image burn. It's not a permanent image burn. I personally use a plasma television for all my gaming because I find it easier on the eyes. I also have a, a what do you say, a LCD television, but after watching it for about two hours or three hours, my eyes get a little bit fatigued. That does not happen with the plasma. Also with plasma, I generally get a lot, what do you say, good contrast. Again, the con with the plasma is that if you have a very brightly lit room, then the picture will be very dull. So that's the major difference. Again, the second part of the question he asks is, what is the difference between LCD TV and LED TV? Is there a difference between L LCD TV with LED uh, light source and a LED TV? Again, Priyankin, you have already answered the question because uh, what these manufacturers these days are marketing as LED TV is strictly wrong. These are not LED TVs. These are LED LCD TVs. Basically, what is that? These are basically LCD televisions, but the backlight technology is LED. So instead of using the CCFL uh, lamps that are traditionally used in LCD TVs, the backlit is made up of LED lights. So that's the major difference. This is a marketing plot. Currently, all the TVs, what you see in the market are LCD LED TVs. I hope this answers your question. And the next question comes from Ohuman. Uh, why 8GB RAM of some manufacturer is of a different price and huge difference uh, between the clock speeds, etc. But how could I read those while buying RAM? There are many manufacturers who have their name tags. For example, Corsair, Ven uh, Vengeance, Sniper, Kingston, etc. Like Intel, i3, i5, i7. And what is triple channel memory, etc. Again, oh human, you are just confusing a little bit. Uh, let me tell you that if you're going to buy RAM from a manufacturer, for example, Apple or something, they will definitely price it a lot higher than what you can just go ahead and buy from the outside market. Do remember, it's nothing spe special. Apple, Dell, etc. These do not manufacture RAM. They buy RAM from other vendors, OEMs. So you can safely just go uh, from outside market and buy RAM for your computer. You just need to make sure a couple of things. That is, what type of RAM is used on your computer. For example, DDR2, DDR3. For example, if you are using a, late, a new computer, most probably you will have a DDR3. And most of these manufacturers use the 133 megahertz RAM. But again, as uh, you have mentioned, there are different types of RAMs also available. There are higher speed RAMs also that are available. For example, currently I have this, Kingston had sent me this HyperX Kingston RAM. This is a very high end RAM. And this is a DDR3 RAM. Generally, the RAMs that you get in the market are 133 megahertz, but this is a very high speed RAM. And this is a 2133 megahertz RAM. So again, this is a pretty expensive and a fast RAM. Again, you just can't pop in any RAM. You need to check with your motherboard if your motherboard supports these faster types of RAM. So, but generally, if you're buying a RAM for a normal computer, desktop computer, you can safely go for a DDR3 type that's 133 megahertz. Again, if you're using a laptop, you need to use the SODIM. So just check up your, what do you say, motherboard configuration and it will specify the type of RAM that you can use. Again, uh, I would say uh, you can uh, go with the reputable ma RAM manufacturers like Kingston, Corsair, etc. And there is one more part to this question and he asked, what is triple channel memory, etc. And the thing is that uh, generally with RAM, if you have a normal computer, you might have known that, uh, you might have seen that when you buy high-end memory kits, it generally sold in kits. For example, this is the DDR3 dual channel kit. For example, most of these i3, i5, i7 and most of the AMD computers will use dual channel memory. That means to get the best performance, you need to add them in pairs, for example, two, four, etc. There are some other CPUs like the Intel Extreme series that used to use the, uh, for, for the best performance, you need to use three slots of RAM. That is triple channel. And the latest version of Intel Extreme processors that use the LGA2011 socket, they use quad channel uh, memory. That means to get the best performance, you need to add four sticks of RAM. So you need to use RAM uh, with four sticks for that. Again, for normal desktop computers, that is the i3, i5, i7, and almost all the AMD computers, they use the standard dual channel RAM. So you'll be safe by using two memory sticks. Again, do remember that you do not have to add two sticks. You can also make it work with the single stick, but to get the best performance, you need to add two sticks for a dual channel memory and three sticks for three channel and four for quad channel. And I hope this answers your question. 
so these were some of the questions for the 12th q a session i hope you found them useful i'll be doing the next q a session next week so if you have any particular tech related questions that you would like that i should answer please post them in the comment section below and started with the q a tag that's it for now this is ranjit from techtoolbus.com and i hope that i'll see you in my next video